This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. This chapter deals with error and fraud, uh, and how these undesirable events could perhaps be prevented, or at least the chance of them happening be considerably reduced. Now, error is uh, something accidental happening. We record something incorrectly, uh, uh, but we we don't mean anything. We don't mean to do it. Fraud, however, is deliberate. Uh, someone is trying to usually enrich themselves uh, by putting some entry through the financial statements, for example, uh, which is incorrect but enriches them, or maybe stealing assets. Now, we just need to look at the, the classification of the sorts of error. Uh, in, in one level, it's maybe not very important, but it is probably the sort of thing that, that could nevertheless come up in, in, in an exam. Uh, error of omission. Error of omission, uh, you get an invoice uh, coming in, uh, uh, you have to deal with invoices, posting this invoice, uh, but it kind of falls down the back of your desk. Uh, and so you never do the, uh, you know, the debit expense, credit the creditor, whatever the, the proper entry is going to be for that. Both sides of the entry are kind of left out simply because the, the, the documentation has gone missing. Or you, uh, uh, issue goods or something uh, and no record is is left uh, there's no trace if you like of where those goods have gone an error of uh, commission is well, obviously where you do something incorrectly uh, maybe you pay somebody twice for an invoice the invoice goes around the system you pay it and you haven't cancelled it and you get mixed up and it goes around the system again and you pay it twice or you pay an employee twice, or you pay their expenses twice. All of those are errors of commission. Errors of uh, original entry uh, is uh, where, for example, the invoice uh, is, whoops, let me get that back. The invoice is, uh, for example, uh, for you know, 432. And instead of doing that, you put it in as uh, 342. So uh, everything about that invoice, the sales, if it's a sales invoice, uh, are wrong, the receivables are wrong, and so on. It's certainly not going to cause the trial balance not to balance, uh, but it's what's called an error of original entry, the very first appearance of this transaction in the financial records is wrong. An error of principle, uh, an error of principle uh, is where, for example, uh, you get an invoice for rent, uh, and let's say the the, the rent is you know, five thousand or something of like that. But what you actually do is you debit non-current assets. You see the address or something uh, for the property rented, and you kind of assume that instead of paying rent, it's actually buying the property or something of that sort. Now it's called an error of principle because of course this should be an expense. Uh, however, you've treated it as an asset. Uh, so it's really quite quite serious. It's going to be affecting here the you know the, the profit and loss account in potentially a very fundamental way. And then you have compensating errors where something just by anyway good fortune I suppose uh, one error uh, simply cancels out uh, an earlier error, and there's there's no particular evidence of this. Uh, maybe it can be really quite well hidden. Some of these errors can be one-sided, uh, and if it's a one-sided error, this will cause the trial balance to be out of balance. An error which maintains a double entry going it will never be picked up by the trial balance not balancing. So, uh, for example, uh, an error of omission, where an invoice had fallen down the back of your desk, it's never ever going to go into the financial statements, it's not going to cause something not to balance. An error of commission might, uh, it depends what the commission is. If the commission is debit 100 but credit 200, uh, then, then obviously that will cause the trial balance not to balance. But if all you do is, is that invoice goes around the system twice, 
uh, and you, uh, you know, debit purchases, credit uh, payable to 100, and then again you debit purchases, credit payable to 100, again that will not cause a trial balance not to balance. Errors of original entry will tend not to cause a trial balance not to balance. It doesn't matter we matter whether we do a debit and credit in 432 or a debit and credit in 342. Uh, it's 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 got a balance. Errors of principle. Uh, the the figures aren't completely wrong here. It's just where you put them to. And again, that's not going to be normally shown up by a trial balance. And obviously, compensating errors will not be. But by definition. Uh, if we'd had you know, 50 too much debit in the first error, then to compensate that, there's 50 too much credit in the second error. It's not going to be in the trial balance. So trial balances only pick up one-sided entries. Okay, uh, and these cause the trial balance uh, not to balance. Fraud is uh, an intentional act involving deception to gain unjust or illegal advantage. So it's an intentional act. It is dishonest. And there are two levels at which the fraud could occur. First of all, there is fraudulent financial reporting. And this is where the financial statements have been made deliberately incorrect. And the normal type of fraud there is to overstate the profits. And the managers and directors may want to overstate the profits. Uh, maybe their bonus is linked to profits. They want a big bonus, so they put in false profits, falsely large profits. Uh, maybe what they want uh, is that the company is going to be bought. So they want the company to be bought. They want a good price. You're going to get a good price if you overstate the profits. Or it might be a listed company. And the share price in listed companies, companies on the stock exchange, is very sensitive to uh, the results. Maybe the directors own some uh, shares in the company. And, and they say to themselves, well, if I report much larger profits than actually occur, the stock market will be pleased, the price will go up, I'll make a gain on my shares. So fraudulent financial reporting. And I suppose a lower level, there is misappropriation of assets, basically theft. So it's usually employees, perhaps directors, but stealing money, uh, stealing inventory, or stealing non-current assets, portable non-current assets. These are misappropriation of assets. And we want to try and stop both types of fraud. Fraud requires, uh, whether it's fraudulent financial reporting or misappropriation of audits, uh, or, or of assets, it requires incentive. Why does somebody want to do that? Uh, and of course, the incentive could be just simple greed. The incentive could be, I want to keep my job. If I don't report good profits, my job is at risk. The incentive might be some of these debts or credit card debts are getting on top of them. Uh, they can't pay the credit card, they can't pay their rent or their mortgage, uh, and this, this pushes them into committing a fraud. You also need opportunity. Uh, opportunity, for example, cash lying around, not put in safes, valuable inventory, not properly guarded or locked away, something of that sort, sloppy internal control. Uh, that uh, makes it easy for you to uh, extract money from the company or makes it easy for you to overstate the profits. And finally, you need uh, uh, attitude. Uh, uh, you, you need uh, basically a, a dishonesty. Because I'm sure we're, we've all been in situations where we say to ourselves, well, I could, I could actually do with a bit more money. I have to pay for my holidays coming up. That's your incentive. Uh, you see, uh, sitting around in your employer's office or something, you see the petty cash box, it's unguarded, you could easily take $500 out of that and nobody would know. But I hope very few of us would go and take the last step and actually take that 500 out, because we have a, an honest attitude. It's not something that we're willing to do, we'd ever contemplate doing. 
So you also need this this basic dishonesty as well uh, to put people over the the final hurdle. How can we stop uh, fraud? Well, internal control. Internal control is how the company tries to make sure that records are properly maintained, that assets are safeguarded. And internal control consists of five components. First of all, there's what's called a control environment. And you can think of the control environment as a culture. So think of an organization which was started by an accountant. Uh, and uh, you know, people who are accountants are kind of self-selecting. They go into accountancy usually because they like precision. They like information to be properly recorded. They like things to be filed properly. Uh, and if you're in an organization like that, and at the top you had an accountant or somebody with a similar mindset, they would want things to be tidy. They'd want things to be done properly and recorded properly. If, however, the person at the top is sloppy or they're just not interested in record keeping, some people at the top are more interested in doing deals. And that's fine. It's very important to do deals and make sales and so on. But, but they, 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 they find all this recording of information, getting proper authorizations, going through the, the proper channels, tedious. If that's the sort of culture, then the internal control that will be in the organization is probably going to be weak. You need risk assessment. You need to say, well, where are the risks? Uh, if you don't, if you're working in a, in a in a builder's company, and all they have is you know great piles of sand and gravel and bags of uh, concrete, uh, then okay, there is a risk that those can be stolen, but it's it's you know they're bulky and heavy. If you're working in a jewelry shop and there are diamonds and diamond rings and so on, then obviously these very small, high-value items will be at high risk of being stolen. Or if you're in a, an organization which has a lot of cash floating around the place, a retail organization, then there's high risk there. And where there's high risk, you need better controls. You need detailed control procedures. We'll see what these are later. But, but it could be locking stuff away. It could be making sure stuff is authorized and so on. Uh, but these are the detailed procedures to try to make sure the internal control is working effectively. You need information and communication. So if, if for example, something was recorded incorrectly, you want to report that so that maybe we change the system of internal control to make it better. Uh, or, you know, if you wait to the end of the year but before doing your financial statements, uh, only then will you see that some expense has gone way ahead of budget. Something's gone wrong with that. But maybe if the information is produced every month in terms of monthly management accounts, you'll see immediately that this, this expense seems to be going ahead of what we expected. Is there something going wrong in the recording of that expense? Or maybe even this fraud uh, 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 being perpetrated through overstating that expense. And finally, there's monitoring. Organizations don't stand still, they keep changing. So if you suddenly started exporting abroad, then there's a whole new set of risks which come in. How do we know the goods are safe in transit? How do we know this foreign customer that we know very little about? Uh, how do we know they're going to pay? If they're paying in dollars, what happens when those dollars are translated into our own currency? Uh, there'll be risk there in terms of currency movements. Uh, and all of this means that we maybe have to adapt and change our internal control. Had that one. What are the control uh, procedures? And the control procedures that can be adopted are as follows. First of all, segregation of duties. What auditors don't like is if one person in the organization can order the goods, uh, decide the need and, and place an order with, with their chosen supplier, can count and inspect the goods when they come in, receives the invoice, pays the invoice. Because that means one person has got almost absolute power over that transaction 
what you and and we're very easy for this person therefore to uh, place orders that weren't needed and uh, maybe get the goods delivered to uh, a friend's house uh, and then when the invoice comes in uh, you know they, they they know it's a special invoice with this fraud that's being a, occurring and so on segregation of duties would mean you have one person who decides goods are needed and maybe places the order another person in the warehouse checks and counts the goods when they come in and make sure they have been ordered a person in the accounting department will get the invoice and will check this the goods received note in the order to make sure the invoice is valid and then maybe a fourth person is responsible for doing the the cash transfer based on all the documents that have come before the great thing about segregation of duties is now we have four minds brought brought to bear and, and and some earlier error is likely to be picked up by someone later in the transaction the other advantage is if if is if you're going to commit fraud uh, if there are four people involved you have to probably have what's known as collusion they have to in a way cooperate uh, and it, it's kind of dangerous dangerous bringing people in to the fraud. How are you going to raise the subject with somebody? They might go straight up to management and report your attempted fraud. Physical control, lock stuff away. Lock valuable inventory away, lock cash away. If there's a lot of uh, laptops around, then you can maybe uh, get get those um, kind of cables that, that can uh, attach them to the desk or something. So they can just be kind of taken away by either employees or, or people just coming in and wandering through the office authorization and approval so you know authorize orders authorize overtime authorize the acquisition of non-current assets if you're going to pay an invoice make sure it's authorized and so on terribly terribly common for managers supervisors and so on to authorize and approve transactions started lower down the organization management and supervision make sure people are, are following the rules make sure that the uh, the authorization and approval is is working properly organization uh, split it up uh, so that the person in charge of inventory is separate from the person in charge of production and we have a whole separate area dealing with uh, sales and so on the independent area areas there arithmetic and accounting this is uh, double checking the calculations uh, how do you know that when somebody's salary is produced that it is done correctly now nowadays this has maybe become slightly less important uh, because many calculations invoices pay slips and so on are done by computer and arithmetically they're, they're likely to be correct uh, but what happens if uh, if uh, you know that the thing has been programmed incorrectly? Uh, what happens if uh, you know, let's say VAT is twenty percent? Twenty percent should be added to all invoices, but somebody a program has made an error, uh, and maybe only fifteen percent is added on. So all invoices going out are asking for the wrong amount of money. Uh, uh, so you need to still to do some arithmetic and accounting checks at least on you know the first few items coming out or you need to maybe do spot checks from time to time on several employees wage slips to make sure the right tax rates are being used because the computer although it's it's a great labor saving it then does an awful lot of transactions very quickly and therefore could do an awful lot of incorrect transactions very quickly and finally personnel recruit people of the right caliber give them the training they need if people aren't able to do their jobs if they don't know how to handle a transaction then the chances are there are going to be errors in those transactions so people of the proper standard given proper training tell them if you have a problem go and see your manager your supervisor don't guess this this is very important also in internal control and also uh, allow them to confess you know so maybe somebody discovers they made an error last month far better that they feel able to go to their supervisor and say about the error so it can be corrected rather than trying to cover it up because they're maybe frightened of some sort of reprimand 
Fraud defences are these. Fraud defences are prevented happening in the first place. Detection, if a fraud has happened, how could we perhaps detect it? And then response. So prevention and detection uh, uh, here, for example, the good system of internal control. So you could prevent fraud on the theft of cash by locking it away. You could prevent fraud on the theft of inventory by locking it away. You can prevent fraud through uh, people overstating their overtime by ensuring that it has to be authorised by a manager uh, and so on. So internal control helps with not a lot of prevention. Detection, uh, again, uh, an awful lot of internal control will detect fraud or error. So, for example, reconciliations. This can come under the, the arithmetic uh, type uh, uh, steps in internal control. So, uh, maybe some fraud is being carried out through bank account. Uh, uh, and every month you get a bank statement from your bank. Uh, and what you should do, you should be comparing this to your cash account. Uh, and if your cash account is kind of saying, well, there's $10,000 there, and the bank account is saying, well, there's only $2,000 there, and you can't find any good reason, any timing difference for for the discrepancy, then obviously one reason is that $2,000 has been fraudulently taken from the bank account. And then there's response. What should we do about it? Uh, what should we do? And one of the things we should, of course, do uh, is to find out how did it happen uh, and if we find out how it happened, then maybe what we can do is we can step our prevention, uh, step up our prevention methods, and we can increase maybe our detection methods. But also there is, what do we do with the person who committed the fraud? And there's, there's a range of options there. Many businesses uh, simply dismiss the person. They try to get the money back and they dismiss the person, but they want to kind of keep it quiet because it's a bit embarrassing uh, if a fraud has been committed. Your internal control wasn't very good. The supervision wasn't very good. It doesn't look good on the company. Other companies take a much harder view. They will tell their staff, anyone caught committing a fraud, we're going to bring the police in. Uh, and, and that itself is a deterrent. That is a uh, this is a, a, a kind of prevention mechanism here. If everybody knows, gosh, if I do this fraud, the police will come in, I'll get a criminal record, I'll end up in jail or whatever it's going to be, then, then that is a, a, a powerful sort of prevention also.